Hey, good to see you. The other day on a trail run, I got a really good question. I had a fellow runner ask me, hey, should I use insoles while I'm running? And while the answer is shades of gray, it's yes and no for a lot of different reasons. This is a question a lot of healthcare practitioners get that interact and deal with runners because it's on the top of a lot of people's mind especially with so many products out there that they can use not only different running shoes but different types of insoles as well there's a lot of passionate beliefs on what they should be using and what type of insole if any they should be using and as practitioners we should have some really good answers for this and know how to guide our patients and our runners on what's safe for them and what's going to help them run efficiently and effectively so let's get into insoles a little bit more and talk about this big topic because it's on the top of a lot of people's brains. So let's start at the big picture. What's the difference between an insole and an orthotic? And this is something that you've probably seen someone says, oh, I have an orthotic or I have an insole and they will use it interchangeably. And quite honestly, this is something that is used interchangeably quite frequently. We see insoles have been historically described as things that are OTC or over the counter, things that are prefabricated and you can put that insert into the footbed and basically you put your foot on top of it and whatever shape it is, your foot will rest on that and be able to sit in your shoe with that insole. Now the difference between insoles and orthotics is that orthotics have generally been used to describe a medically prescribed device that's going to either address pain or a medical issue. And so while insoles historically have been used to make your shoes fit better or to be able to help improve the comfort, orthotics have been used to be able to really change the footbed or change the surface your foot is on because of a medical issue you've had. Now, consumers and clinicians, I've heard them both use it interchangeably, as I mentioned before. And so it's okay to use them interchangeably, but it's always good to know the difference between insoles and orthotics. Now, as we really learn how to prescribe good insoles for our patients and our runners, it's important to kind of go to the basics. What is an insole and what makes up the components of an insole? So there's a couple key things to look at, and I'll go through this a little bit slowly. The features with an insole is important to remember that there's volume or the thickness of the insole. There's the arch height, that's probably the one most of us have heard of the most, how high that arch is, how supportive that insole is. Those things oftentimes go in, in together, but there's a lot of other things that will make up whether a insole is supportive or not. Um, and that includes how rigid that insole is or how inflexible it is. The more rigid it is, the more support or more um, uh, stability it might provide. It also might send more force up through your uh, lower extremities as well with it being so rigid and then the heel cup size as well how deep is that heel cup how round how supportive is it how well is it going to lock your heel into place and all these components can affect our runners and can affect the way their lower extremities interact with the ground certainly a lot of it can be really good but there's a couple things that we need to be mindful of for example, we need to be mindful of what insoles we're prescribing, especially with the right anatomy. And I'll just give one example off the bat here. If you have a really, really low arch and you get a really high arch insole, that high arch insole will most likely put pressure up into the arch of your foot. And that isn't something that is generally liked by patients. And can we can see downstream effects of pathologies occurring or diagnoses. So we want to be really careful with certain insoles and certain different anatomical features. Additionally, there's some other things that are really important too, and that gets into your gait pattern and how you're running or how you're walking, the shoes you use, and then also what's your anatomical makeup, what makes up the interaction between that footbed and your foot. And so there's a couple key things we want to look at. Now, when we go about prescribing footwear and orthotics or insoles to patients and runners, we want to be careful to think about the whole picture. We don't want to just look at one thing. For example, oftentimes you've seen these devices, someone will 
stand on one of those little absorption or absorptive mats and that will take an impression of the foot and that impression of the foot then will be translated into a little graph and then it'll print out what that insole should be and then obviously they'll make it or they'll point you to that insole to, to purchase or some insoles just have a lot of cushion to them and make it really cushiony and can make it really really flexible or um, make it really soft to walk on while that may not help support it might just feel nice and comfortable under your feet. But the important part of this is that we can't just look at one aspect of someone's anatomy or one aspect of an insole to be able to get the right prescription. We want to look at the entire patient. Just like we would if you came in with shoulder pain, we'd want to look at the entire patient, what their clinical picture looks like, rather than isolating certain aspects like maybe just their, they have some glenohumeral joint protraction and it needs to come back, well, that protraction might be because they have forward head posture or some other issues. We need to look at the full clinical picture to be able to prescribe the right insoles. And one of the best ways to do this is to use a couple of examples of clinical presentations or running case studies that we can go through and actually uh, kind of go through the process and clinical reasoning of why we select certain insoles. Now, all this is on solutionseducation.com under the blog section. You can check it out there if you like the written form. If you're listening to this, you can certainly listen to it via podcast or listen to it over a YouTube video as well. Now, some of us are more verbal than others. Um, uh, verbal than you know, uh, visual learners and some of us are more audio um, as well so it depends what works best for you but I'm going to encourage you to kind of think about these cases and why these insoles might work or may not work. So I'll go through running presentation one or the runner number one, and we'll go through posture analysis and we'll go through running gait analysis findings, diagnosis, running shoes worn during the analysis, and then we'll go into the insole and why I would suggest a certain insole for this patient. So this patient came in and they were a runner and they had some flat feet, so pes planus, bilaterally. They had a moderate arch height in non-weight bearing, but then that moderate arch height collapsed during weight bearing. They also had some genuvalgum as well, so knees come inward. And then on their running gait analysis, we found forefoot external rotation, overpronation, subtalar joint valgus collapse, heel strike, and genuvalgum without a thrust, along with hip drop. And a lot of that was bilaterally, except the forefoot external rotation was more on the right than the left. Now, as we got into any diagnoses or injuries, we also saw that they had right plantar fasciitis, so that was an issue they were suffering from. And the running shoes that they wore was a minimal arch support, minimal heel cup support, moderate cushion, and minimal heel drop. So now that we have their shoes and their whole clinical picture, let's talk about the insole prescription and clinical reasoning. So the right insole or a good insole for these, this patient would be a moderate arch support with moderate heel cup and minimal cushion. And this is primarily because this patient will benefit from arch support and heel support that will stabilize the foot and limit that overpronation, genuvalgum, and hip drop. So it really supports that collapsing arch and continues to try not to let that plantar fasciitis get more aggravated by getting it overstretched, overstretched, overstretched. Additionally, we wouldn't want to give an excessively high arch support here because they don't have excessively high arches. But that moderate arch support should be enough to be able to support that arch and hopefully reduce that plantar fascia and provide some medial support up to the lower extremity. Let's go on to runner number two and talk about their presentation. So on the posture analysis, we saw an arch height that was within normal limits bilaterally, Q angle within normal limits bilaterally. We also saw that the running gait analysis findings, they were a forefoot striker bilaterally, overpronator bilaterally, genuvalgum without thrust bilaterally, and hip drop bilaterally. So a lot of similarities between this and that first patient. And they had a diagnosis of right patellofemoral pain syndrome. The shoes they wore during their analysis were minimal arch support, minimal heel cup, and minimal cushion, and they also had zero drop. So here's what the insole and running shoe prescription was. And you'll notice I said insole and running shoe prescription because we can't really prescribe just an insole without knowing what those running shoes are. In the first case, we certainly, we, 
we looked at their shoe and we said, okay, that shoe may work or may be something to work from, but I wanted to give it an example of just prescribing an insole. But in fact, most of the time, I usually prescribe an insole and a different uh, uh, shoe because we want to make sure those things are working in tandem. Rarely do we see a shoe we really like or an insole we really like, and then we just need to change one. Some patients really like their shoes, they don't want to change, so that's a whole other separate issue, and sometimes that's where some good patient education can come in. So with this patient number two, or runner number two, we prescribed a neutral shoe with minimal heel drop, and you'll notice minimal there is an actually higher heel drop than the zero heel drop, with moderate arch height um, in the insole. So this patient would benefit this from, from this because we want to limit their forefoot strike, we want to also limit their overpronation. And so we want that slight heel drop and we also want to make sure they have the medial support for the lower extremities. So that will hopefully encourage a heel strike gait pattern, which then could provide a little more stability as well. And also we are hoping that's going to get the pressure off the front of the knee, under the kneecap, patellofemoral joint, and hopefully reduce that um, patellofemoral pain syndrome that they're having as well. Let's go on to runner number three. And feel free to pause or rewind or anything during this time. Runner number three presents with a posture analysis of an arch height excessively high, forefoot um, external rotation bilaterally. Both of these are bilateral arch height and forefoot external rotation. The running gait analysis findings were heel strike bilaterally, excessive forefoot external rotation bilaterally, excessive dorsiflexion bilaterally, and overpronation bilaterally. They're coming in with right tibialis posterior tendinopathy, and the running shoes that were in the analysis were neutral, moderate arch support, minimal heel drop, and high cushion. So the insole and running shoe prescription and clinical reasoning here would be a moderate heel drop running shoe with high arches and moderate rigidity in their insole. This is because we want to give that patient enough arch support under the arch. They have high arches. Support that high arch. Certainly, we don't want that arch to collapse because that potentially is adding more stress to that tibialis posterior. That's causing that tendon to work really hard. And obviously, if that tendon is working really hard during that excessive dorsiflexion, that initial contact, um, excuse me, if that uh, tendon is working really hard while they're landing on the ground, yes, during that excessive dorsiflexion and initial contact, we can hopefully lessen that um, a dorsiflexion at initial contact, reduce the stress on the tibialis posterior, as well as limit the overpronation and risk of arch collapse. So for that patient, that would be a good approach. Now, as we talked about each of these patients, there's obviously a whole litany of other considerations to think about. Some of these include whether that patient might benefit from custom or prefabricated orthotics. So let's get into some of those details as well. Now, it's, careful, it's, it's good to weigh the pros and cons of insoles, and we want to make sure we're doing our due diligence here. But one of the most common things we hear is whether patients should be using orthotics or insoles short-term or long-term. And the emerging evidence actually shows that short-term is actually a really good way to use orthotics or insoles. So you use those insoles a short period of time during rehabilitation to get a change in their running form and to get a change in their anatomy, whether it be strength or mobility. And that is to design to eventually wean that person off the orthotic or insole, because essentially we don't want to use that as a crutch. And then ultimately they're without the insole and able to use their body in the way it's designed. And that is our gold standard. Other times we see that patients are using insoles or orthotics long term. And that's okay too, especially if we don't see those anatomical changes or those changes in biomechanics with rehabilitation or whatever we're doing in terms of interventions. However, we want to then educate that patient on the use of those orthotics or inserts long term and to make sure that they're consistent with all their shoes and be really mindful that they're able to use them and have access to be able to use those orthotics and insoles. And then lastly, another question, and this is a really, really common question I get, but um, should I get a custom orthotic or a prefabricated orthotic? And the research is very, very well demonstrating that prefabricated and custom orthotics pretty much carry the same 
outcomes. However, it's important to note that some patients actually prefer custom orthotics for a more comfortable fit or more the site-specific pain. And additionally, while there has been some research on the topic of using orthotics for, for specific diagnoses, pathologies, atypical anatomical features, things like that, we do see that research does have various forms of validity and support behind it. So we want to be careful with what research we're consuming there and what we'd actually say is, yes, that's really good concrete research that we're going to implement. So we want to make sure we're considering the research source and making sure that we're careful when we're thinking about that. But prefabricated orthotics can be a good place to start with patients and oftentimes it's a less expensive case too. So Obviously, the subject of insoles, orthotics, and running shoes is a really vast one. And if you're interested in learning more about running gait analysis, please head over to the Essentials of Running Gait Analysis course and check it out. We talk about insoles, we talk about running shoes, and we talk about ways you can implement that directly into your next running gait analysis. But until then, think about what insoles or shoes you're prescribing to your patients and certainly check out our content and, and other blog posts on running shoes and especially uh, other information that we have on the site. Until then, take care and um, stay healthy.